Three rolls on the tower, eight random questions here. Whatever you get, that's where we start. Okay. No, what? I have to put it in here? here. Sorry, I'm not used to doing things in person. You got a good number to start. Number three, my lucky number. Zombie apocalypse. Uh Uh-huh. There is a zombie outbreak. Yeah. You can team up with two actors from the fall of the House of Usher. Who do you pick that you think will give you the best chance of surviving? Uh, Two questions. Slow-moving zombies or fast-moving zombies? such a good question. It's really important. What do you least want it to be? Fast-moving zombies. All right, so it's fast-moving zombies. And the other question was, um, like, do I have to deal with all of the geopolitical situation as well? Is this a Walking Dead scenario, or is it just like, I'm in the mall, I have to get out? You're on the set of the fall of of the House of Usher, and all of a sudden it's like, they're here, and you need your people. Michael Trucco, uh, because either one of those situations, like, he's going to be able to negotiate and get us food and water and things like that. He's also going to kill a zombie. And then, um, has to be an actor? No, I'll take someone behind the scenes. I have to bring my husband. That's fair. Like, I can't. That's fair. Although, like, in that situation, I end up as bait, which I don't like to be the bait person, but, like, you end up as bait. Absolutely. Because this is the thing with, like, slow moving zombies, you can all fight. With fast moving zombies, you have to throw somebody to the zombies, That's and fair. I need Truco to survive. And Mike is such a fighter, like, the first person thrown to the zombies is me. So, okay, sidebar, I would take. Ruth Cod Ooh. as B. Oh no, Ruth. <laughs> Only because I love Ruth. There was um <laughs> when we were shooting Usher, we were still in COVID, and you have these little plastic, like cubby con- like little boxes that have your name on them with all of your PPE, so like your mask yes. and your things like that. And on Midnight Mass, I'd given everybody nicknames. And so in Fall of the House of Usher, everybody was a Kardashian or a Kardashian adjacent character. And um I made Ruth be Jordan Woods, and she hated that more than anything. <laughs> and so she kept switching my name tag because I was Courtney, and I made me Jordan Woods. And then once she put a full size Jordan Woods cutout into my trailer to prove that I was Jordan Woods, and I was like, that's ridiculous. Anyway, so Ruth gets fed to the zombies. So on, I have follow up questions now. <laughs> so on the set of Usher, it was uh, Kardashians or Kardashian yes. adjacent. Did you have a different theme for past sets? Um, so Midnight Mass, because that was the only one with the boxes, was just oh, regular nicknames. Like I think um, Sam was Butts, Rahul was Nance. Um, who else had a great one? Oh, um, Michael Truco was Sexy Flanders. Um, that and everybody had different names that just like nicknames that went Brilliant. on their boxes. And Brilliant. then we leveled up at Usher and everybody was a Kardashian. Or Glad a Kardashian we don't need PPE cubbies anymore, but I feel like you should just like, I know you got nice trailers, but like just have cubbies so you can do it again. I sometimes put people's <laughs> names on their uh, trailers Okay, as well. okay. I like this. I want to hear uh, this continuing uh, tradition. Thank you. All right, second roll on the tower. See, this is, I'm such a <laughs> rebel. Now I want to like throw it somewhere else and be like, I don't even need this tone. <laughs> Can you give me one audition high, but then also one audition low, and tell me what you learned from that low that you could apply to future auditions? Fun fact, I'm a terrible auditioner. I uh, am such a type A overachiever, I want to win so bad, and that is anathema to art. And so I'm great on set and collaborative and like really fun and natural and like it all flows through me, but in auditions, I'm in a real binary, like is this right or is this wrong? So it's hard to pick just one terrible audition, but I'll go back to that one. The greatest audition was the first time audition for Mike. I love this story yeah. so, so much. And so, yeah, it's a great story and I wish I had another, like I've had a handful of very nice auditions, but that was one where I had been so deep in the rat race of acting and like really trying to do a good thing. And Mike in that audition reminded me that acting was an art and it wasn't necessarily commerce. It's the best audition high story because it feels good in the moment, but it's also implanting an idea in your brain that reverberates yeah. throughout your career and you could remind yourself that art first. Yes. Like, you're, you're good at it. <laughs> and this is the th- I was talking to my friend today about auditioning and, you know, with self-tapes, we're not always in the room with a casting mm-hmm. director. We're sometimes just helping each other out. And as an actor, you'll ask the person taping you, like, hey, do you have any feedback? And for me and this friend I was talking to, we never do that because 
The thing that gets you the job is that one weird, ineffable thing that you can't fake. And so if I say to you, do you know you always pull on your ear whenever you are lying? Then they stop doing that. Then they lose the opportunity to have gotten the job because the casting director or the director is like, that was so unique mm -hmm. and, and specific and I love it. And so it's really about the one individual essence like being poured out of you. I have one particular follow-up question that I'm even more uh, eager to ask. I'm going to save it for the meat of our interview. So, so that was a high. Do, do I you got have, the low? Um, the low? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in order, in order to make a living as an actor, oftentimes you have to do commercials, and I famously only have done one, which is a psoriasis commercial. <laughs> I love it so much. Please, if we can link it, I would love to link it. <laughs> we it's got like, the Curse of the Black Dahlia last time, and we're going to get the psoriasis commercial this time. It's just because like I'm so sad because I'm itchy, and I have no friends because I'm so itchy. And then I have like friends. and Anyway, it's great. Um, but I got a real chip on my shoulder about commercial auditioning. And occasionally I wanted to be like cute, and like I thought I was going to be so edgy. And I was doing a birth control audition where it was like, you know, these like, I guess it's like Yaz now or any of these number of things like these female products where everyone's so bubbly and this was back in the early 2000s where like even the blood was like blue liquid. There was no charm or um, irony to these commercials. And so it was just like, let's do an interview and we'll talk about birth control. And they asked me, what's your favorite thing about babies? And I was such a brat. I said, the tender meat. <laughs> And I was expecting a laugh like this, like just like, oh, she's so funny. And it was deep horror. <laughs> and I was immediately beat red, embarrassed. Like, oh, no. no, I thought I was being funny. And instead, I was just like horribly just disgusting. Who is this disgusting actress? Never went back into that office again. I gave you the reaction you've been waiting for all this time. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right, you have one more role in the tower now. <laughs> do, 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 do. All right, up. Oh, gotta go again. No! Ah! <laughs> you did what you said you I would do, though. See. What does it say? It's an eight. eight. Do you want to re roll? No, or are we going with the, the eight? It's the perfect expression of my essence. This one makes me happy. It's my would you rather question. Yay! <laughs> would you rather have to fake sneeze or fake vomit in the scene? <laughs> sneeze. That was so quick. Mm -hmm. was so quick. I love a fake sneeze. Really? Oh my God, it's Most such a impressive. Because I, I always do that because everyone's like, no, vomit because it's gross. But like, it's hard to do a convincing fake sneeze. <sighs> There's a lot of great ways to do it. Here's sneeze. my favorite follow up to that. What is a like seemingly silly everyday thing that we all do that's really difficult to replicate believably in a scene? I always think of that, waking yeah. up, driving. Uh, plugging in your cell phone or laptop. What? <laughs> I know, it's so weird because like you have, when you actually do it, right? Like sometimes the cord's not the right way and mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. When you're doing it in a movie or a TV show, you have to just do it. You don't have extra beats to like turn the USB the other way. It just needs to go in correctly once. And it's because you just want it to be a smooth transition. And it's so annoying. I'm gonna think about that when I'm like fumbling in the dark tonight to like mm -hmm. plug in my phone before Because bed. that would be the human way to do it, but like that's never gonna be useful in plot. So you're just gonna have to yeah. not, you're gonna have to just do it right the first time. What's up, everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night. I've said this before and I'll say it again right now with a favorite, Kate Siegel. It's I'm Lady so happy. Night! Or, I'm so happy happy right now. Me too. I mean, it took us years to sit down across from each other just one-on-one -on -one in person. First question I had for you this time around, of all of the earliest projects you did, which one would you say was most influential in terms of teaching you about the stories you most wanted to tell and mm -hmm. the types of onset environments you most wanted to work in? Um, I did a play very early on called The Heidi Chronicles, which is this amazing feminist uh, story about a difficult woman and just like her journey through her life. And before that, I was super into my my like Sigourney Weaver era where I wanted to be in Aliens or I wanted to be Angelina Jolie in Tomb Raider. And I really just wanted to be an action hero, which is hilarious because I'm very clumsy. And the act of doing my own, like being that would be, it would be ridiculous. And that, that play introduced me to both complicated characters and she has a four-page monologue Ooh. on stage just standing there and I was like 
I love monologues. And this is before I even met Mike Flanagan. <laughs> Perfect. So it's like the dream come true. Just do monologues. I feel like you need to do an action movie now. I would I, love Because I feel I feel like movie. once you train, especially train with the pros that this oh, yeah. industry has, you probably I'd sell out. I work very it. hard and you I do the work. best I could. You work really hard. I'll just bring back the other follow-up question so I don't forget this. But I remember at, at least this is what I'm taking from the way you talk about your craft. That yeah. like you're very detail oriented and mm-hmm. maybe perfectionist like me. How do you quiet your mind on set? Is there anything, any like technique you use to kind of force yourself to make it all melt away and lose yourself in a scene? So anything that puts me more in my head separates me from the moment-to-moment reality of acting. So any kind of meditation or things like that puts me more Mm -hmm. into my head. And so the things I like to do are kind of twofold. One is that part of my brain that's always kind of like fumbling with the Rubik's Cube of the scene, I think is beneficial. I, I love her. I used to hate her, but now I love her. And so what I'll do is I'll give her something arbitrary to think about. Like, for example, I say this a lot, but I thought about when I did that long walk and talk with Zach in Midnight Mass, I, in the back of my head, wanted my brain to work on the fact that Erin Green hadn't brushed her teeth that morning. And so, like, like it, it had to do with the way that I would look at him and, like, it really came out in behavior. But it was a completely arbitrary choice that let all the rest of the work that I did about the backstory about me traveling around the country with this band and how much I love Riley and what it's like to be here and who's watching me and all that stuff. It kind of melted away because it was such a visceral experience to be like, do I have stinky breath? And I would do that. I find those choices really help me. So, for example, with Camille, Camille, um, the arbitrary choice that we went with is that Camille is sober. She's sober up until the moment she takes that edible with her brother. She relapses, and then every choice she makes after then ends up with her death. And so when I was, like, at family dinner, you'll see me. I don't even know if this made it into the cut, but while I wasn't focusing on, like, my father, my brother, my sister, the death and this and Madeline and all this stuff, I was just moving the wine towards me and away from me because I didn't want my family to know I was sober because they would think I was weak. I love details so much and it's like I none of this stuff makes it into the script and I clear it all with Mike ahead of time or whatever director I'm working with but it just really allows that part of my brain that just wants to chew 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 to have something so the rest of it can flow what a cool way to approach that what a cool way to approach that but also not deem the way that your brain works as wrong because I I have that where I'm constantly like thinking and obsessing and usually people are like like meditate stop doing that but or works for some not for others yeah and also like look what your incredible brain has brought to you (laughs) my my brain has come up with all of these wild dicey questions and I'm grateful for it (laughs) why why not give it something to chew on oh it's really cool you and the team have given me so much to chew on. Before I get there, I had a couple of other uh, broader questions mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you. First, something that I've gotten in the habit of asking a lot recently, just because I think it kind of, you know, like peels the curtain back and lets people understand what the reality of this industry really is, about, is about the idea of kind of breaking out in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, pick a different role if you'd like, but I always look at Hill House and I'm like, That put you on the map in a completely different way. So can you pinpoint a misconception about what it is like to really break out, have that breakout project in Hollywood, but then also pinpoint something that really did change for the better because of how big that show just took off? Oh, yeah. This isn't going to be a satisfying answer for you. Um, I actually would say the role that changed everything for me was Hush. Hush. I was wondering between the two. (laughs) And uh, I was reminded recently that after Hush came out, like after Hush happened, it was just radio silence. Like Hush was was huge and everyone loved it on Netflix, but like I couldn't get a manager. Like I couldn't get auditions. Like I was, it wasn't, and it was this shocking realization. There's this wonderful Mark Duplass uh, little snippet about the cavalry. You watched it. Everyone who's watching this watched this. And it was one of those moments where I, and, and people have hence, and the same thing, like, listen, for all that it's for all the times that I auditioned and all of the respect and pride I have in my work, I was married to the showrunner of The Haunting of Hill House that gave me an opportunity that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Like I might have gotten to interview or like audition for that part, 
but it was given weight because of my station. And I think it's important to talk about that. And so what I say to people is that it is so far from what you think it is. It's so far. It is, it's, it's glitz and glamour and smoke and mirrors. And the reality of succeeding in this business is totally different. And the only way I was able to do it and the only way I am able to do it to this day is to make movies with my friends. I had to write my own stuff. I have to work with my friends. My friends give me jobs. I give them jobs in return. I make new friends. I work with those friends. And like sometimes my newer friends are more famous <laughs> or they are more successful because we connect because we're a fan of each other's work and then we want to work together. But my route, because like I'm not a great auditioner, my route has always been I meet someone, we want to work together, and then I do a lot because I love to do a lot of the dragging the elephant up the mountain. So right now I'm starting to produce little indies mm -hmm. and I'm going, oh man, you know who I love? I love David Desmalchin. I wonder if he would do this with me and stuff like that. And so I've never had success in what I imagine to be like the your tip. I can't even think of a person who you think of as just like auditions, books, auditions, books. If you really do even the most basic scratching below the surface, a lot of Creators like to work with the same actors, mm -hmm. and those actors maybe have one other major fan, and sometimes they go do that, and they go do little jobs here and there. But, like, this idea that you should just keep sending in self-tapes and, you know, praying to the, your higher power, I'm like, make movies. Mm -hmm. You've got a camera. Like, just keep doing it. You'll start meeting people. You'll be more satisfied. You'll Your craft will improve. And you might develop a different relationship with what you think success is. Mm. Oh, I love that so much. And you know I'm I'm obsessed with the idea of the Flanna family and creating a group of like-minded, talented people who are kind and supportive of one another and bringing more people yeah. into the family along the way. I'll I'll go there next. And I know there's going to be many examples. But there's that... also – sorry to interrupt. Oh, go I didn't for it. To. No, go for it. It's that – and now at this point, because – uh, I've worked with my friends and my family, a lot more of those offers are coming in, right? Mm. This is also important. Uh. And people have started to ask if I want to do this or if I want to go play with another group of friends and do that kind of thing. And a really amazing thing starts to happen. I'm allowing myself to be picky because I'm like, listen, I have a great core group and there's al it's always a lot of fun. We love what we're doing. I'm allowed to stay with my family. My husband and I move our family with that. So for me to go do the time traveler's wife, mm. or for, it has to be an incredible opportunity with incredible people, which is something that the possibility of working with Stephen Moffat on The Time Traveler's Wife would have put me into a hot sweat of desire 10 years ago. And I would have just blown it because I would have wanted it too bad. But now with the recontextualizing of my priorities, those opportunities come and it feels easier. It feels less desperate. It feels less painful. And the work I want to do comes to me more because I feel more in control of myself. So many follow-up questions. The one I was thinking about before, and I'll preface this by saying you could probably name a million names to answer this question at this point. Can you tell me about a recent new addition to the Flana family and the moment that made you think, like, yes, this person is perfect to be with us and I'm excited to work with them? Matthew Lillard. Is the right answer for me as a screen just, just person? What a human being. What a part. He, we, he's in Life of Chuck. I'm not going to give any spoilers on it. Mm -hmm. But um, we were all in Alabama. And it was it happened to be a particular day where there was a huge amount of Flana fam around. People who went all the way back to Hill House. And we were all hanging out at the hotel where we lived in where we sh when we shot Hush, me and Sam Sloyan. And we knew Lillard was in town because he was working next week. And he walked uh, into the bar where Sam and I were sitting. And I and Sam was like, is that Matthew Lillard? And I was like, I think that's Matthew Lillard. And I was like, what do we do? And she's like, say something. And I was like, I can't say something. Say something. So I go, Matthew Lillard. And he looks at me like ready to sign an autograph or something like that. And I'm just there, I go, I'm Kate Flanagan. I'm Mike's wife. <laughs> and he was so, from that moment, he was like, oh, my God, hi. And we invited him to dinner. And it was like he'd been there all along. Joyful, kind, talented, beyond belief. I mean, elevates every room he's in. Like, it felt like he had been part of our family the whole time. We just didn't know. Oh, I love that so much. 
I've um, Scream is one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm obviously obsessed with that cast. I went to MegaCon recently, and I've never really experienced the fan con vibe. I've only done San Diego and New York, which is a little more marketing, fan forward, but more marketing. Watching him and the cast of Scream work the panel room and how just like giving they are to those crowds and watching them do those autographs and and like the signings all day and how they make that person at the front of that line feel like the only person in the room. It's not easy to do that all day. And they do it and they give so much of themselves to everyone. And as someone who's part of that fandom, my God, my heart is full watching that. Yeah. So nice. And this is where we put like the little ding. Horror people are the best. It's, but it's true. It really is true. I've thought about that since the day that I lean towards this uh, genre more than any other. And I always say that the people who come up with, like, the sickest shit on screen are usually, like, the kindest, warmest teddy bears out there. That's true. All right. I want to ask a couple more big, broad questions. First one of – this is a big one – of all the actors you've worked with, can you give me an example of one person who has a process that is similar to your own, where the second you met and started working together, you're like, we get each other, we know what we're doing. But then I want the opposite. Someone who came to the table with a different approach to the work and it challenged you to adapt and try something new and for the better. All right. The one who is very different from me is Zach Guilford. Mm. Love Zach. We worked um, like in a bubble for the first two weeks of Midnight Mass. It was all of our stuff together. And he is the most low-key, blue-collar actor you will ever meet. He, it's like I was ready with my like very like depth of backstory, ready to talk to him about what our relationship was like in eighth grade. And he was just looking at me like I was this strange, delightful alien that had landed into a green room with him. And he was like, I don't know, I memorize my lines and I come to set. Which, after working with him, it's slightly different. There definitely is artistic merit and talent there. It's not as easy as he makes it seem, but that's his process. His process is just, I don't know, it's not a big deal. We do it and then we go home. And it was great. It was so helpful. It was so easy. It was so smooth. And he was so respectful of my process as well. If I wanted to tell him a bunch of random stuff, he would listen to it. And But he wasn't about to, like, change who he was or what he was doing for what I was doing. And it was a really great way to both accept the way I do it mm-hmm. and to see how it's done a different way. It was really – it was it's eye-opening. Like an ideal kind of collaboration yeah. right there. Yes. And, of course, my dream, my buddy, partner – everyday bruv is Rahul Kohli. The two of us are just freaking nuts for each other. (laughs) Um, People are like, it's so great to see you guys in a scene together in Usher. And I was like, it was actually the worst because Rahul and I just wanted to hang out and we couldn't. We had work to do. And so like we had to like do shoot a whole scene when we just wanted to mess around on set all day. But we really we both take it very seriously. We both love the weird physicalities, like him with all his tattoos, me with my wig, and just like we love that kind of outside in. We love trying to figure out how uh, to say a sentence like a human being might say it and like bounce ideas off each other. And at the end of the day, we love laughing at the whole idea. Mm. You two are something. I love that scene so, so much. We're going to get to that. One more question before I go full force into the fall of the House of okay. Usher. It was something you had brought up uh, last time. So I had I had asked you I had asked you if you picked the role of Aaron in Midnight Mass, and you were explaining to me that for folks in the Flanna family, you know, you let Mike put you where you think you'll serve the mater- where he thinks you'll serve the material mm-hmm. best. But then you followed it up by saying like, but sometimes you get a few cards to play, and it was making me wonder: Can you give me an example of what one of those cards were and how you played it? I definitely played Aaron Green. I definitely played that card. I had read the novel version of it back when we shot Hush. He had told me the story a bunch of times. Um, There are a handful of cards that I tried to play that I didn't get. For example, Rose the Hat I really wanted to play. I was pregnant and also I was like a million degrees not famous enough for that part when it became a studio movie. And I thought it landed in the right hands with Rebecca Ferguson. It did, but I could still see you doing it It would have been fun, but I don't, like she was just so delightful that I can't be mad about that. (laughs) Um, there is a movie called Somnia. Oh, I guess it's called Before I Wake now. Yeah, yeah. Back when Before I Wake was Somnia, Mike and I like had just only done Oculus together, and I was this extra, and I really loved the mom in Somnia. I hmm. really loved that part. Uh, but I wasn't I wasn't ready for that either. And so oftentimes I try to ask for a part and don't get it. And but Aaron Green was something that I had never done before. All of my characters, with the exception of Aaron, are bombastic and big 
and like Theo has a point of view <laughs> and you know Maddie and Hush has a point of view and Camille yeah. and like all of them even stuff that isn't with Mike like Time Traveler's wife big person and Aaron is this like very tight bud and I've never done it and then she had to stay perfectly still in the center of the storm and that idea like as Hamish and Sam and like wow <laughs> the angel and like Robert Longstreet and just like Michael Truco and like Matt Bidel and oh my god Annabeth Gish and like she just has to stay absolutely still when the most crazy things are happening to her and the idea of that challenge was just too delicious because it's so far from me as a person and I found it so hard every single day and I think when I go back and watch it, and I love to watch Midnight Mass, when I watch it, that struggle of Aaron trying to stay still reads as the struggle of the person so completely. I'm like vibrating on the mm-hmm. inside and totally still. And it, it gives all of that feeling that Aaron needed to kind of magnetically hold the center together. And I think it was brilliant of Mike to know that that was how I was going to vibrate in that role makes me happy that you watch and appreciate your work. I, I just hear, like, I understand to, to each their own, everyone's different, but it, it makes me a little sad when someone tells me I can't watch myself yeah. on screen when, like, I could see how incredible something is, and I want them to feel what I feel when they watch their own work. Yeah, I think you need to wait. Like, I need to wait a little bit. Like, I wait six months to a year. But then I think of it as, like, game day tapes. When I'm preparing mm. for another role, I'm like, what did I see? When did I see the stitches? When did I see, like, when did I flinch? Just stuff like that. To build off how you were just talking about Erin, this can kind of lead us into Fall of the House of Usher. In terms of her being something different for you, what was it about the role of Camille that made you think, this is the next best role for me to take as an actor who is continuing to evolve my craft? Um, Camille was handed to me as a fully created thing, right? All of those uh, siblings were written for specific people. And Camille was specifically written for me. And it was just like a delicious gift. I don't even think it was like a stepping stone. For me, it was just a feast. I was like Trevor and Mike and Michael Fiminari, the director, they were basically like, take off the reins, go. Go, run, little pony, run. Uh. And I was like, run? And they were like, run. And I was like, what about a wig? And they're like, a wig. And I was like, what about this weird dress? And she wears a turtleneck underneath it. And then she's wearing these weird shoes. What if she ties her pants? And they're all like, sure, what is it? Iconic fashion. Usually that's not the first thing about a show or movie that jumps out at me, but my God, that look is just seared in my brain and so many people's brains now. It is perfect. We love, oh, Camille's look. Perfect. Oh, I love it. I miss her. Where, what would you say is the biggest difference between how you pictured her when they first handed you the role and what she wound up looking like in the finished product after you got the opportunity to collaborate with a costume designer and all that good stuff? I mean, The only thing I wanted that I didn't get just because it was difficult because we were block shooting, which means we shoot in a location. Mm. And so it could be like seven different times in one day. Everything that happens in dad's office. I wanted those like claws. I wanted long, like glitzed out, like with every – it's as if she has nails for every outfit. Just claws. It was really – I really wanted that and I wanted that to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And we just did, we couldn't make it work. Understandable. But Terry and I, Terry Anderson, who did the wardrobe, we worked very mm. closely with every single one of Camille's looks. A lot of her stuff was pulled from my own closet, and but we got almost everything we wanted. <sighs> oh, so that's why no Camille looks were part of the auction that just happened. Yeah, because that's my clothes, <laughs> B. I, I love, love that so much. Yeah, I am the proud owner of Perry's credit cards. Oh. The second I saw the the cause that all of that was going to, I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm committing to something, and yeah. what better thing to pick than someone with the same yeah, name that's as me? So that, that was done. That's something that happened. All right, here's the interrogation part of our interview, because... I am obsessed with backstory. I know you like oh to do God, so your, your prep work, so I have a feeling you're going to have an answer to yeah. a lot of these questions here. I have so much backstory for Camille because I had to sit around for six months. Don't tell me that. I'm going to keep you here all day. Yeah, I'll tell you everything. <gasps> Even after we're done, I can give you, like, I know her from when she was born until when she died. I'm so excited okay. right now. Okay, I'm, I'll start. I'll start broad, so you could start with whatever you want. But I'm most curious to hear about some of her core memories. So, what uh-huh. is something you came up with that we don't necessarily see or mm-hmm. hear about on screen, but we can feel informing your performance throughout the show? Yes. So, so I believe that Camille and her family were Roma, and 
Bruce, uh, sorry, and, and Roderick Usher came across them one time near Spain and slept with my mom. And I grew up in that way. I was a little bit of like a con ki- a con artist kid and doing all of that. And then I found out when I was 18 that my dad was Roderick Usher and he asked me to come be with him. And I went to my mother and my mother said, when I was young, 18 years ago, I slept with the devil. If you are going to this man, I'm telling you, I was like crazy. I've gone f- I full love out this. there. You told me about the uh, Aaron's plumber last time. So yeah. I expected all of this yes. right now. So I was like, if you, and my mom said to me, if you go live with that man, you are making the choice to go be with the devil. And I wash my hands of you and what will happen to you. And I, I was enticed by the money. I was just like this mm-hmm. wild kid. So I left. And that's sort of why when the monkey is about to rip my face off, I get it. Because I was like, this was inevitable. Oh, my God. My head is exploding. So the line, uh, fuck, fuck it, it I, got I got mine. Yeah. Was that always what was scripted? or did always. you ever? And what was it like figuring out like the pitch perfect way to deliver a line like I that? I knew it from the second I got the script how it went. Because it was, there's this thing so that happens. Good. There's this beautiful structure to that scene, which is like, um, you get this slow, 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 slow creeping up, slow creeping up, slow creeping up, slow creeping up, and a denouement that that bottoms out at fuck it, I got mine. And then, foo, she gets her face ripped off by a monkey. <laughs> and it's such a weird structure. And so you ha- that fuck it, I got mine has to be absolutely angelic almost. Like true acceptance yeah. and a true understanding that she got the information she needed about her sister and that her sister was messing with those chimps and she was right and it was it. But this has to happen and there's no other way. And so it's acceptance, which is the plie, which lets you, the audience, envision how horrific that death must have been. One of my favorite things in any of these interviews is when I hear an actor explain their approach like that. And I'm sitting here thinking, that's how I interpret it. That's what I felt. I get it. That's right. Oh, wow. That yeah. scene is something else. I love how many of my backstory questions you just answered, too. Here's here's one more specific thing. And I think, uh, what what was it that Carla says? Oh, uh, she pinpoints why Camille and Vic don't like each other as them being so alike. And Camille hates Vic because she's better at hiding it. Is that the gist of it? Or did you come up with any, you know, life moments where the two of them fought and that began a rift? Um, sorry, I, 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 I am going to plead the fifth on this question. The answer oh. is yes, I know why. Oh. I know exactly why. Okay. And I'm not going to share. That's fine. That's fine. I respect that. I respect that. And I also like when, when shows have me thinking about this stuff and yeah. it, makes the show live on in my brain. And I'll tell you that Carla is 99.9% right. Okay. That's 100% almost it. What was it like working with Carla in that scene? She has so many great moments in this show, but because of the physicality and those demands in that moment, that's probably one of my favorite performance beats of hers. Absolutely. I was so blown away by her um, focused professionalism doing that wire work Mm -hmm. and that uh, chimp behavior. We worked with a movement coach. Terry Notary. Terry Notary. (laughs) I think he's like one of the greatest. The greatest. (laughs) I mean, famous for doing chimps. So he was there working with Carla and having her watch Watching her hold in one hand all of the physical demands of that performance and hold in the other hands all the emotional demands of that performance, brilliant. It was an acting class all oh, day. She is something else. She really is. Really, the, the whole cast here is just absolutely, like, pitch perfect, incredible. I want to make sure I didn't miss any of my backstory questions here. I think, like, I think you just gave me the whole I'm very impressed well, right the now. The one other thing <laughs> I love about this is you know how later on in the show, Verna tells them what they would have been? Oh, and they don't say it. They don't say it for Camille, but I know what Camille would have been. What is it? So Camille, the whole thing is that she works with dirt, right? She moves, spins, and dirt. I think Camille would have been a potter. Huh. She would have made things with dirt in her hands. I could see that. And so that whole thing, but she couldn't, once she kind of distanced herself from her family, her family of birth, she couldn't get dirty anymore. She couldn't get intimate anymore. Everything went internal. And so that, like, desire to work with dirt came out this (gasps) way. And it was like, it's very sad. You just brought up intimacy. So I guess I'll, I'll go there next. Did you ever come up with any experiences or life moments that made her not want to choose, I guess, a traditional partner, let's say, well, and pursue that kind of relationship? I feel that we're both very lucky because today Mike put on Tumblr, 
Camille's whole thing, so I'm allowed to say it now. Okay. <laughs> very early on. Very early on. Like, it's the day I heard that I had sex with my two assistants. I went, That's you have to answer that question. Why and how, mm -hmm. right? Because we're not going to, I know I'm not going to have a sex scene, but I need to know specifically what happens. And I was like, and this is a real, like, this is like a glue minefield. Because if you want to talk to other actors about kink or like how you have sex off mm -hmm. camera, like there's a lot of steps there. Like you want an intimacy coordinator, you want a third party, you want to make sure you're not tr triggering anybody. Also, they don't need to know. It doesn't happen on camera. I needed to know because so much of it happened. So what... I did in my internal work and eventually asked Igby and Aya if this was okay, if this if me imagining this was okay. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because everything's weird. Um, anyway, I came up with puppy play. It's a very specific kink where you pretend that your partner is a dog, is a puppy dog. You play fetch and roll over and play dead and you scratch behind their ears. It's very subservient. And in Camille's house, if you look, it's cage. cages, <laughs> leashes, masks, yeah. all of that, dog toys. And I said, and Mike was like, that's ridiculous. We're not doing it. And I was like, listen, hear me out. Hear me out. And this was very important to me because I don't think kink is just a random thing that happens to a character. I think kink is a hugely important part of everybody's life. And that kink is very revealing. And to play generically kinky would be a disservice mm. because generically kinky would be the same thing as playing like generically German. You need to know where you're from. You need to know what kind of German like this. So I was like, this specific kink that Camille's into has to do with intimacy because Camille cannot deal with the idea of being intimate with an equal. She can't deal with being responsible for somebody else's feelings, for them having anything other than complete and utter adoration. It's why, like, people love babies. Everybody loves a baby because, like, you just adore them and they adore you. There is no human really there who might have opinions and needs and things like that. And so Camille wanted to be at the bottom of a puppy pile. She just wanted this young, complete adoration. And she wanted to take care of them. Absolutely she did. And, she like, she paid off Tina's student debt. Like, she wanted to pet them and brush them and hold them and have it be, like, weird and sexual and things like that. But she could not allow them to be human with her. She couldn't have intimacy the way other people can. Oh, my. There's, I love that you think all of this through. I say this all the time. And again, I'll repeat, everybody's approach is different. What works for you is what works for you. Yeah. But I am a big believer that when you think things through to that extent, you can feel it in the finished product, yeah. even if it's not the focus of a scene. It's never. And like, listen, as an actor, none of that ever comes up mm. in scene work. And it's just something I do because it's fun for me. Again, it's the Rubik's Cube. And I'm just sitting there like in the three hours you sit in your trailer between setups and I could play Candy Crush on my phone and sometimes I do and sometimes I think of random shit that happened in Camille's life and it's just a way of distracting my brain to eat the stage fright. What do you think Camille does when she turns off? Like when no one is in the room, when she doesn't have to like put put on that kind of like armor and strength? Yeah. What do you think she does She for watches fun? built videos. She loves... She does watch built videos. That's <laughs> another one. You should watch the progression of that where she gets interested in him and that first that she sees him right at the beginning and she's watching his video and she's like, that's disgusting. And then she's watching her video and she likes it. And then she's wearing a full built sweatsuit. She is wearing it, yeah. And trying to do it. She And she's not in love with him. Like, Camille can't love people. She is not mm. capable of loving a human being. But... She was a, she really just like that whole thing was so weird and positive and so different from her life and just like so much fun to stare at. Let's go to a surprise on set. So you've worked with a lot of these actors before and mm -hmm. I know you know they're all great, but can you give me an example of someone who did something on the fall of the House of Usher set that made you go, I know you are super talented, but I never realized you were capable of doing that. Henry Thomas in this part so cracked me up so hard. I remember Mike coming back the first day he shot Frederick and he was like, you have no idea. This is brilliant. I think it was when he said, we have the power of, uh, Pim has the power of six or seven lawyers. And it's just like, he was like, we couldn't get through taping the scene because it was so funny. And when we were all sitting there for family dinner, mm -hmm. which we had to shoot twice, um, we, he does this thing with the, the paperwork and he goes, you want me to sign it? I'll sign it right now. And I was crying off camera. It was just so funny. I've never seen him do anything like this character. That character was not written necessarily the way the choices he brought in with the man bun and like and that like goofy man to psychotic torturer. 
is such a brilliant choice. That's a brilliant arc because he didn't have to do that. But that transition from like laughing stock to monster. Mwah, so, chef's kiss. so good. I don't know if you want to talk about shooting that scene twice, but one thing I was wondering when you get when you mm-hmm. have to do something like that, is there anything that wound up changing in the scene for the better where you got the experience of doing it once and then you were able to make a different decision for yourself to maybe enhance something that you had done before? I think what was so amazing was watching Bruce Greenwood go through it so because good in this. like I I watched, I saw this on Twitter and it's true. Every single shot you see of Roderick, except for him sitting across from Dupin, is an emergency reshoot. And so Bruce comes in with one, maybe one weekend to prep that whole role. (sighs) And so all of these children are in awe of their father. And so it was very easy for me to be in awe of what Bruce was doing because it felt like he had lived with the role for six months. He was brilliant. He was professional. He was giving as a scene partner. He was flexible. He was inspiring. It was so for me. Yeah, getting to do it again is great. But what was really great was what Bruce did, like yeah. how he nailed it. Perfect in this. Perfect, Perfect in this. And the the Madeline Roderick sibling back and forth. That is like an expertly crafted dynamic. Yeah, they did oh, a great job. So so perfect. I feel like this is like the million dollar question. Let's say. Camille was in Roderick and Madeline's shoes. She got the opportunity to have a meeting with Verna and, you know, get that offer, have that knowledge of being okay going forward. Do you think she would have made better choices than they did? Or is this something that is always in them to to pursue me first and not yeah, care I for mean, other I think people? Camille absolutely makes the same deal. But Camille doesn't want money. She wants knowledge. She wants to know everything. And so the deal Camille would make is, I know everybody's secrets in exchange for that. She doesn't necessarily need to be okay, because once she has the secrets, she'll be okay. Do you think any of the Usher siblings would have made a different choice, or every single one of them would have essentially have been doomed? That's a good question. Uh, let me think. Perry, yes. Leo, maybe. Leo might have stepped out. Uh, I would do it. Tammy would do it. Uh Victorine would do it, and yeah, Roderick would absolutely do it. So yeah, I think all of us, I think Leo, maybe not. It's hard to know. Rahul built, like, the the saddest soft boy. So it's like... He's so good, too. He's so good. I also just appreciated that Mike made a cat a hero this time around. Yeah, just finally. never forget the That's dead true. cats on the beach in Midnight Mass. I'm like, what, what, what do those cats do? And now all of a sudden... Pluto yeah. rises to the top. To the top, just when he <laughs> when he hops on that that dead body and is like, "Me and my Gucci collar are oh, going home." Oh God! I feel like, and after I watched that episode, five minutes later, my cat scratched me or something. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> Bring cats. Um, I love ending with this question now: of everything you accomplished in the fall of the House of Usher, what particular beat, what moment do you think you're going to look back on and say to yourself, "Damn, I'm really proud of what I did there." I don't give a shit, Beth. That moment, we we had so much fun. I had built that for six months, that oh. whole monologue, just walking around Vancouver everywhere, just mumbling that whole thing, dopamine riddled little fuck puppets, and just like everything, just trying. And I was like, I, I don't know how this is going to come out. I don't know. And I did it once or twice, and it was pretty good. Like, it was fine. We were burning it through, and they had a lot of good coverage. And Fimi, uh, Michael Fimiari, our director, was like, he was like, just just let go more. Let go more. Just really, like, go. And I was like, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> but I was like, okay. And so what I thought was, like, because there is a certain quality to Camille that is soapy and is cartoony. But I think that's her personality, not necessarily the um, the acting style, if you get what I mean. Like, mm-hmm. she has her number one boss mug. Because there was this whole sidebar in my head. I was like, does Camille read Poe? Because if she does, would she know that... Le Bon, the security guard, and, like, that would maybe set her off for something because she would know. And I was like, so she can't have any understanding of Poe, but why does she call him Toby Dammit? And I was like, oh, she's a fan of The Office. (laughs) And if she's a super fan of The Office, so much so that she needs someone named Toby to yell at, she's going to need a mug. And so I leaned into that side of Camille that, like, loves this weird shit. And so I was like, that is the Camille who needs to come out when she's angry. The Camille that she tries to hide, which is goofy, over the top, wants to wear a bizarre outfit and drink out of her number one boss mug. 
the mug kind of answers this question, but now because I want even more, can you give me an example? And I asked you this yeah. for Midnight Mass too, and this is how we got to the plumber for like a teeny tiny detail some somewhere in this show oh, that yeah. nobody else is going to know about. Maybe they don't care about, but you cared enough to fill in that blank. And yeah, there's so much. It's the number one boss mug That's because I had to work backwards from Toby Dammit because again, this is great character work on the page. Uh, the she calls her assistants Toby and Tina, and that's not their names. And she always calls him Toby Dammit. So why would she do that? And I was that led me to, could she know him? Huh? Huge fan of The Office. Needs a number one boss mug. Details. Details are so, so important. All right. Now comes a time where I ask about, obviously, a future project that is the life of Chuck. Yes. I don't know what you're allowed to tell me, so just say no to anything I ask that you can't mm -hmm. talk about. Can you tell me who you're playing? No. Okay. I'll take that. <laughs> Are you able to tell me anything about the format of the story? Is it going to be structured like the short story or is it going to maybe be more linear? No. <laughs> like no as in you can't tell me. I can't tell okay, you. I'll take that. But I will tell you this, it's amazing. It's beautiful. I would beautiful. believe that. I'd it believe is that. not a horror movie. Oh, okay. I I I would I would see that. Yeah. I would see that based on the material, the source material. Here's one that maybe maybe you can answer. Okay. What is it about a Life of Chuck feature adaptation that feels right to do right now? Is there any particular theme that the story leans into that you think audiences kind of really need? Um, there's a moment in Chuck uh, after in the short story where there's a dance. And after the dance, the narrator, I believe, said that that's why God made the world. And I think people forget in this onslaught of the 24-hour news cycle horrible things that are happening. And like, listen, I don't believe in an all-knowing God with a long beard who made the world. I do believe in magic. And I do believe in the universe in ways that I can't understand. And I do think it's important when we're dealing with these horrible humanitarian crises and the like, people at home who can't get medical care and what is happening with our banks and what is happening with billionaires and everything being eaten alive by greed, that there are moments that you need to be able to look at in your day-to-day -day life and go, that, that is why God made the world. And that's going to make it bearable. And so I think Chuck will make life more bearable for people. <sighs> We need it more and more now. And that, that dance scene, I can't wait to see that on screen. Oh, it's really just come good. to life before my eyes. I'll end with one other question. Just because you brought up the idea of wanting to produce more, mm -hmm. what, is, what is something about the past experiences that you've had that is influencing the types of projects you want to produce yeah. and what you want to give to your companies, to your cast and crew as a producer? So I want to make weird feminist shit with my friends. Okay. Yes. And so however yes. that happens, like if my friends are like, I've never written before, but I wrote this movie, I'd be like, let me read it. Or if some someone I don't even know slides into my Twitter DMs and is like, hey, can we take a meeting? I have a weird feminist shit movie. I want to know that. I want to, to reach down and pull other people up the ladder. I'm not necessarily at this point like interested in producing studio movies. I'm looking for indies and like maybe podcasts. Like let's start small and build more families. Let's build families. I don't think I could have heard a better answer to that question. Seriously, that's beautiful. Congratulations on this and everything you've accomplished. And thank you to you and the Flana family for continuing to gift us with these things to obsess over. I look forward to very many more in the future. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me. This is a blast. <laughs>